Yes, my name is Heather Gray, and the program is Just Peace, and I want to welcome you to a discussion we're going to be having, having with Rashid Nuri this evening. Uh, Rashid is the director of Truly Living Well Center for Natural Urban Agriculture, and uh, we're ha- a- actually, I'm going to get this out, we're actually having monthly discussions with Rashid about any number of issues, and Rashid, welcome. Move up a little uh, bit there. Welcome. Thank you, Heather, for welcoming <laughs> me to... WRFG. Yes, it's a pleasure. Before I go any further with uh, this discussion with you, Rashid, I want everyone to know that the opinions expressed on Just Peace do not necessarily represent the opinions of Radio Free Georgia Broadcasting Foundation Incorporated, its staff or volunteers, and portions of the program are pre recorded. So, Rashid, there's so much to talk about. One of the one of the notices that we sent out actually around the city yesterday and today and the discussion with you is about food prices but you know i keep saying okay rashid before we go into this or that discussion tell us a little bit about truly living well for those who haven't heard about this just tell us a little bit i know you have now you have six gardens in the city right yes we do so tell us a little bit about it just quickly well we just added two more in the edgewood community at the one is at the cohen middle school the farm garden, and then we also have one on the corner there, the Edgewood Community Learning Garden, where we now grow food, teach students. We have a direct connection to the classrooms. I'm very excited about that. But we grow food. We teach people how to grow food, provide agricultural education, and we build community, um, engage in economic development and job creation throughout Metro Atlanta. That's wonderful. And uh, you have two markets, actually, during the week as well, don't you? You have a market on the Washington Road site on Wednesday afternoons and then also at the Wheat Street site on Fridays. From uh, 2 until dark. And it's an opportunity for people to come out and get their fresh vegetables. It's just, it's, it's just a treat. Well, we want people to get this good food and be healthy. So and this is a discussion that I know we have a lot um, about the healthy foods and the challenges that we face with industrialized agriculture. It's interesting, Rashid, one of the books that um, you have recommended that I read is um, Stuffed and Starved. It's by Patel, who is uh, an Indian. Raj, 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 what's his name? Raj. Raj Patel, Patel yeah. And uh, he's actually Indian. And I know he used to work with Food First, but the one of the interesting things in this book is that he said the closer Mexicans are to the U.S. border, the less healthy they are because they're eating a lot of the American foods, he said. Things that are leading to diabetes and obesity and so forth. Americans are the fattest, I can't say the most unhealthy, but we sure down the list for healthy healthy population because of the various diseases that we have which all comes from the quality of the non-food. No, not even the quality. That's a bad phrase. From all the non-foods that we eat. So many people base their diet upon what they can get at the local gas station. And um, they're sick as a result. So Patel's observation that those close to the border are unhealthy uh, makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, it's, it's really quite interesting. The notice that I sent out around the, the city, Rashid, is something that you and I have also discussed in the past a bit, which is that riots, and it's highly likely, and there's word that's coming out about this as well, that the unrest that we're seeing in the Middle East and elsewhere is partly related, if not in some instances totally related, to rising food prices. I think yeah. this would surprise people, actually. Well, we've talked about that a couple of times on your show. Well, go ahead. Um, Let's talk about which it more. Is the, uh, the, what underlie what they're calling the Arab Spring was the uh, rise in the cost of food. Here you have uh, millions of educated young people who cannot find jobs. Uh, they're having difficulty surviving uh, without a job on the leg- meager income that they may have. And then the price of food goes up, makes people angry because they still don't have jobs. And whatever income they had was already meager and now is taking a a costing more to provide the food. And, you know, there there are a number of factors that went into this was, oh, I guess last summer in particular, there were extreme droughts in Russia Mm -hmm. that raised that that created a shortage of grains 
that would have been distributed in the Middle East. The Chinese are buying everything in sight. So the mark, the the amount, the price of commodities. Went through the sky. American farmers are making money. They don't need any subsidies right now for the corn and wheat. Prices are, are so high, have been high. I really don't know what it is today. That has led to unrest. And I think there's a historical precedent for that, uh, that you will find that, that higher prices in food under grids, a lot of riots and revolution, rebellions in, in throughout history has been around food. Okay, so one of the things that we said in the note that went out is that in almost every revolution, I mean, it's interesting, the American Revolution, the American Revolution was about tea. Was about tea, but, but, other, tea. but other commodities, too. Oh, oh, yeah, I mean, tea was the, repre- was the symbolic. Being taxed. Yes, which meant the price went up. People had to pay more for right, tea, right. and the British merchants made more money. Uh, and they said, no, we're not going to do this anymore. Uh, but yeah, it wasn't just that. There were other commodities, but those that were being in- imported that were being taxed. Yeah, uh, right. The French Revolution apparently had something to do with sugar and, and salt. Let them eat cake. And let them eat cake. Mm-hmm. Marie Antoinette, that's mm-hmm. right, you know, saying let them eat cake. Yeah, they, they worried about bread. Let them, have some, let them eat cake. Very, and and you got to remember what class that she came from. I mean, so these there there are class issues that involve. Basically, today the issue who who makes the money? It's the banksters and the multinational corporations. Back then, it was the state, which was the king, and the French Revolution, uh, and the aristocracy and bourgeoisie in 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 France uh, made great distinctions between they were getting gathering gaining all their wealth from the peasantry, and the peasantry was not eating. So they got mad and said, y'all got to go. Really simple. Very simple. <laughs> and it had to do with food. It had to do with food. So this is why... Uh, what about the Boxer Rebellion? Same thing. You know, the Chinese were upset they didn't have food. Okay? Right, right, so right. they got mad at the emperor. Let us eat. We, we need some food. Okay? And even then, you, you already had a, a tremendous European incursion to uh, China where they were bringing opium from Afghanistan uh, into China and extracting the silk and the tea and getting people doped up, uh, ignorant, and uh, exploiting the continent. And people got mad, you know, did something about it. And and it's it's not new. It happens all the time. You go read read the history, how crack cocaine has taken over the black community, uh, where that came from, and it was subsidized and brought in by the government, and right, keep the people dumbed down. Then they want to know why folks rise up in rebellion because they can't get food. They can't afford it. Uh, It may be there, but if you can't afford to pay for it, uh, you're going to get mad and strike back at someone. And you you look at the connection, how many civil disturbances you've had since the 80s, particularly out in Los Angeles. And that's what the issues were about. People wanting to eat, being able to support themselves, having jobs, uh, having access to education, which costs money. And, and you know, you follow and see who's making the money. I mean, and, and it's the same yeah, pattern. Follow, follow the money, follow the I, dollar. Uh, that's my <laughs> philosophy. You want to understand what's going on, just follow the money. Yeah. See who's getting paid, who's not, who's making the money, who's not. And today, the uh, multinationals, banks, I mean, we went through this whole crisis. You know, Obama's administration is, is in big trouble because he helped bail out the banks. And, and then the very people who are bailing him out are trying to beat him up, keep him from getting back in there. The multinational corporations and the banks are the ones who are making the decisions in this world, and uh, it's creating problems. We're going to come back and continue with this discussion now. I know a lot of you out there would like to ask Rashid some questions as well. And we will do that uh, in, in a few minutes. But uh, right now we're going to take a break and we'll be back in just a moment. Stay tuned. All right. Again, we're talking with Rashid Nuri, who is an urban farmer here in Atlanta. This is a monthly discussion we have with Rashid. And we're, we've been talking about the food prices and the rising food prices and the problems with access to food and various commodities and how this is often related to, almost invariably related to, civil unrest and revolutions. 
And if you start doing some research on this, it's really very interesting. Now, what we've seen also in the Middle East, a lot of folks have now been coming out with this, that there have been rising prices of food also through, throughout the Middle East, which is uh, making people uncomfortable and making some demands for changes. Usually, usually there are some other things also related here, but it's hard to know what is the ultimate cause sometimes of these things, and food is definitely <clears throat> part of the mix. Rashid, are you wanting to add something to this? Yeah, you know, I think the issues that 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 really need to be confronted, as this was suggested before the breaks, is that we we need to how are we going to wrest control of our destiny, of our future, from the multinationals and the banksters who are controlling events around the world, right. and what kind of changes are going to are necess- necessary in society to bring that about? Now, we could. There, we have lots of academics who are studying the subject or just intellectuals who are writing about the subject. Raj Patel talks about the problems as he sees them and also many of the solutions. And, and I hearken back to my training in the 60s, which was that if you're not a part of the solution, you're a part of the problem. So, and, and the fact that all politics is local. You think global, but you act local. So for, for me, the best way for me to address these issues is to grow food right here in the community and feed people. Okay? I mean, it all comes back home. What you going to do? And for what I'm trying to do is feed people, teach people how to grow food for themselves, help them to attain horticultural literacy, food self-sufficiency, dealing with issues of food sovereignty. And I, I firmly believe that we can address most of the ills that we find in society. An aspect of it can be resolved through the production of food. Now, you have a lot of a, a grant. The, one of the best examples that's close to us is Cuba. And okay, here you got a country that has been economically boycotted for the last 50 years. The U.S. has cut them off. The U.S. created Cuba and as a, as a haven and a haven for uh, vacationers, gamblers. You know, it was a, it's a creation of, of the U.S., and then they cut them off. So what they're going to do? So at first they, you know, they worked with the Russians for many years, but then Russia fell apart. Uh, the Soviet Union fell apart. So Cuba had was in a bad way. How was Castro had to say, "How am I going to feed my people?" So they have one of the foremost urban agricultural programs in the world. How they they support folks growing food in the cities. And I had a conversation with, with, with Dr. Rizli Muhammad earlier today. He runs the Nation of Islam's farms down in South, farm down in South Georgia. And he says he, he thought we, he and I had a disagreement, but I said no, because you can't get rid of the rural farms. I mean, you, we can grow here in Atlanta, in the metropolitan Atlanta, we can grow all the fruits and vegetables that we need to feed everyone. But we're not going to grow corn and rice or wheat or raise cattle or uh, in the cities, you know, you got lots of people with their backyard chickens, and I think that's great. But you're not going to see a backyard beef cow for those who eat beef. That's just mm-hmm. not going to happen. Mm-hmm. And if, you've, if you've, <laughs> I don't think a lot of people have seen what pigs look like these days. They're not the little oink oinks that you see in a song, Green Acres. They're huge. Right? They're huge, massive. Man. Yeah. Put a saddle on them suckers and ride them. Uh, <laughs> And I pers- I don't eat pork. I don't eat most of those things. But you're not going to produce those in the city. Right. But what we can do is grow fruit and vegetables that we can feed everybody. We need to do that. Castro has done that. I mean, so that little island, Cuba, small island in the middle of the Gulf, and they're doing all right. They don't have to import food. You know, minimal. I mean, there's some things I'm sure they do. But as a whole, they're not important. In fact, they're, you know, you know they're, one of their major exports is tobacco. Uh, for for cigars, but they make the best in the world. And, uh, well, you know, it's interesting, Rashid, that here we've got all over the country and, and, and actually all over the world now, we have these Occupy movements. And they're saying, well, they're occupying Wall Street and then a lot of other issues are coming up of where there's been corporate greed and corruption and so forth. So one of the things that people are saying that I'm saying also that um, agriculture needs to be occupied. Well, so. I, I, I don't agree with that. One. All but right. We, but what reason I don't to go, out, go out there and sit down and occupy some of these big commercial farms, you're not going to stop them from doing what they do. 
Okay, what we have to do is create the alternative. So rather than getting mad at them, let's go do what we can do. And this is what we talked to the young people that occupied Atlanta. They, they came out to the farm on multiple occasions, and we had some extensive conversations with them. You know, if they really wanted to do something downtown to make a point, plant a tree. You know, they could have put an apple tree out there, plant some apple trees. Why did the uh, Occupy Atlanta folks approach you at Truly Living Well? Well... Why did they pro? I can't answer that one, Nadia. The uh, I think that because we, we we show they they were seizing land downtown. We and we 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 we're, we're seizing land. I'll say that real quiet. Uh, <laughs> we're seizing land and making it productive. We yeah, are, we are we are, right. we are doing something with the land that we've obtained around. We got vacant lots. We're growing food, okay. And you know they they had that big commons down there, and all they could do was fuss at folks. Now, God bless y'all who who are part of that movement. I I understand and appreciate what you were trying to do i thought they would needed to be a little bit more focused they needed to have a, a greater clar- more clarity in what it is that they wanted to accomplish out of that event and i didn't see that our suggestion was plant a tree now if y'all need something to do come on out here and do some volunteer work on the farm grow some food so you can feed yourselves down there. you want to occupy you're still running home running to the grocery store the same people you mad at the same one percent that you're occupying against here you're going to go take your money and run down there and buy food from them there's some contradiction in there as far as i'm concerned how did they respond to that it was interesting one conversation we stood out there for an hour one day just me and eugene our operations manager and we he and i were just sitting around there trying to figure out why we weren't going home and then here come these young people up there he said ah it's amazing how God works. So they came, and this is what we're supposed to do is have this conversation with them. So they came to us, and then he brought some more people the next day. They actually listened. They, they came to us with their arguments about why they're doing this and how important it is and trying to tell us what we didn't understand. I said, whoa, time out. Check yourselves. And listen for a second. And they did listen and understood some of the comments we have, that's why they went back, talked to their people, they made a few changes, and then brought some more people back to the, our site to be able to have a conversation with them. So I, I think what sometimes, and I, I, am, I am absolutely unequivocally guilty myself, when I was their age, I'm thinking I knew everything. You couldn't tell me nothing. I knew it. And in fact, I put my finger in your face to explain it to you what, why you didn't understand what you're doing. Uh, <laughs> But I, as I've gotten older, I realize again that that there was a futility in that because if you're doing what you want to do and you're doing it the way the best that you know how, that's the best you're going to be able to do. I, I, it's not on me to change your mind, but it, it's on me to show you how to do it different. And that's that's my orientation these days. You know, I'm going to open up the phone lines here. The phone number here, uh, the studio is 404-523-8989, 404-523-8989. So give us a call and join the discussion. Rashid, I was hearing that in Vancouver, I think it's Vancouver, where a huge number of people in the city, I think it's close to 80%, are actually growing something. I mean, it might just be some parsley or something on a on a windowsill that was my kind of people yeah yeah so but but i thought i thought it was really quite interesting because uh it was a the program i was listening to was talking about this very thing about people growing food in the city we have a caller we do nadia paul are you there uh first of all can, can you tell us how many jobs you're creating and what kind of jobs you said in your mission of your organization that one of the one of the goals was to create jobs, and then you said you've done that somehow. Yes, sir. This in 2011, I think that's where I am. Uh, we have paid uh, 40, at least 40 people this year, this calendar year. So we we've been able to take the money that we've generated, the revenues, and uh, redistribute it through the people working with us. Uh, who are able to circulate that in the community and just, you know, contribute to the economy in that way. That's great. My second question was, uh, I've been involved in marches and picketing for several migrant farm worker labor groups, and I was wondering if you could give the listeners a picture of the pyramid, how much of every dollar goes to large corporations when people buy food in grocery stores, and how much of the dollar goes to small farmers, and how much of the dollar goes to migrant farm workers? Do you, do you know that? Or well, do, do you know it? 
Not a hundred percent. I've you, seen it in print. Yeah, I, I can't. I can't. I can't give you those numbers, but I, I have an understanding of how it works. You know, the, it used to be that that most people in this country engaged in agriculture. Today, you know, you, you'll still have oh, a good twenty percent. Twenty percent of the population is engaged in some aspect of the agricultural business. The actual number of farmers, I guess, is less than one percent, around one percent mm-hmm. these days. And most of those farms are big farms and they're corporate farms. They're not small farmers. The number of small farmers has uh, diminished. These days, you, you, you look at a, a graph, you'll see a slight upturn in the number of, of black farmers in particular who are get, people who are getting back involved in it. Where the real money is made in agriculture is not in the growing of the food, but it's in the added value processing. And the added value processing is done by uh, the large processes such as Cargill, ADM, Dreyfus, Bungie, ConAgra. Um, these are the folks who are taking the raw material. They will not assume the risk of the farmers themselves. You're not going to do that because it's too risky. <laughs> Farming is too risky. But they will take the products that the farmers produce, process them. You know, they will store them, process them, transport them, d- uh, distribute them. Uh, and that's where the real money is being made is in the added value processing. You take, for example, even it, uh, a chicken company. Georgia is huge in, in the chicken industry. The processors, and I can't even name their names have changed since I was in the business. Purdue. Well, yeah, they're, they're a fine example. Purdue doesn't grow chickens. Okay, Purdue contracts, they have contract growers. They provide, the farmer puts up his land and he borrows the money for the equipment. And then Purdue will provide them with the feed. They'll provide them with the chicks. They'll, after they're grown, they will pick them up and pay the farmer for the weight. Then they will take the, the, uh, of, of the birds. So the farmer takes all the risks of disease. He takes all the risk of, of death from various causes, but all the chemicals that they give those birds, the feed that they give the bird, which contains the chemicals, the birds themselves all come from Purdue. They do not take the risk of growing. Then they will pick those birds up and take them to their processing facility where then they cut them up and do all the things they do to, 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 and distribute the chickens. They're not taking that fundamental risk. So the real money that's being made is, is with the, uh, the processes. Now here, let me give you, here, see if you can see this picture. Picture, picture an hourglass. You know, one of them things that you turn upside down and you keep the, yeah. keep the time. And if you know that, that the, the, the flow of the sand in the hourglass is controlled in the middle, okay? You got, and that metaphor holds up for uh, in, the, in the agricultural industry. The, the, at the top, you'll have the growers, and at the bottom, you'll have the, the consumers. consumers. <laughs> right. right. And the, what, who controls in the middle where the choke is are the processors, are the large commercial uh, multinationals who control the product, not the production, but the distribution, processing, assessing, and exchange of the food. And that's so, the conundrum that we're caught in. So even the larger farmers have a problem unless they, are, they have a direct connection with the processors who are in the middle of that hourglass, hourglass controlling the, controlling so the flow. To, to make a can of soup, or let's talk about the soup uh, section in most grocery stores, you're not just talking about farmers making the ingredients for the soup. You're talking about multinational corporations processing what the farmers have made into the soup. They're the ones that are making the money. Thank you. Thank yes, you, sir. Paul. I'm going to open up the phone line again, which is 404-523-8989. Please give us a call. And thank you, Paul. Uh, that was a great question. Yeah, no, it was a really good question. Yeah, and, and I, li- I like that scenario um, of the, the hourglass Rashid, and of course, that middle section—that's where all the money is as well. <laughs> they got it. That's, that's, that's where, where all the money, money is. is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and so there are any number of industries in America where we could say the same kind of thing. Actually, all of them. All yeah, of I them, mean, that's you, true. you know, it's not like see if you go to a back in the day, you go to the corner grocery store, uh, you would see jars on the shelf of of home canned products that were grown locally, processed locally, and someone's in Aunt Susie's kitchen. All right, and they were able to sell them at the store or, or you know, on the road. I can remember as a child driving to the country and see fruit and vegetable stands on every little farm as you went down the road. And people would have their specialties. But that's not true now. you got a handful of companies that produce all the processed 
foods that people eat. And this is another reason why I say you shouldn't, you should not shop in the middle, middle of the store. You want to go around the periphery. The in the middle is where all that processed stuff. You don't want to eat anything that you that has more than five ingredients. It's not food. Okay. If you can't, you should read the labels. If you don't know what it says on the label, if you can't pronounce the words of the ingredients, <laughs> don't eat it. Okay. If it has more than five ingredients, you don't want to eat it because it's not food. Uh, and we get caught up there. I mean, how are you going to have something? You, you go in and look at the labels on the thing. They have 30 different ingredients in it. They're not food. Most of them you can't even pronounce. Uh, you shouldn't eat it. You want to go around the periphery of the store where you're fighting. Now, you know, some of my vegan friends will have a problem with part of what I'm saying, but uh, for everybody's not a vegan. But you find your fruits and vegetables, your dairy, your meats, your seafood on the periphery of the right. around the outskirts of the all out, the whole you know, foods, the whole foods, whole foods, right? <laughs> whole foods. Uh, versus all the stuff that's canned and processed, right. which you'll find in the middle. Right. I just want to tell our listeners that we are talking with uh, urban farmer Rashid Nuri, and you are listening to WRFG Atlanta eighty nine point three FM. We have a caller, Nadia. We do. All Lin- right, Linda, are you on the line? Linda, welcome. Yes, I am. Hi. Um, I just wanted to, I had a little anecdote. I stopped at this little stand to get some tomatoes, and then I found out that the, the farmer told me that to, the tomatoes came from Tennessee. <laughs> and he was selling them as local, right? Yeah, mm. and I thought that was hilarious. Did um, you buy them? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> they, they smell like tomatoes, so I bought them. Um, but I wanted to ask. You oh that's right you can't talk about prices on the air no we're not talking about prices uh, but okay. can you well, ask something else well let me <laughs> well, no, if you ask the question in a way that doesn't give specific numbers oh do you have a layaway plan <laughs> <laughs> my um, Linda, my my phone number is four zero four five two zero eight three three one. Okay. And what we we do, we you know we sell food, and I want most important is to get the food into your stomach. Uh-huh. Um, so you call me. We we take food stamps. We take WIC vouchers. We we take every with credit cards, cash check. Okay. We take money any way we can get it. And if someone is in need, uh, we'll give it to them. Okay. Okay. Uh, All and right. So Perfect. if you if you you call me, and we can see what we can do. All right. Okay. That's I great. Sure will. Thank you, Linda. We appreciate you calling. Again, the phone number here into the WRG studio is 404-523-8989. All right, Rashid, we're going to have to get to some discussion about crops. Well, right. let me ask, actually, before okay. we move to crops, yeah. because right. I'm curious, Rashid, on most of the farms that you have, the six farms, it's fruits and vegetables, as you mentioned. That's so. Right. I don't know for certain that you're a meat eater, but if you are and or if you were, where would you personally shop? Where would you get your meat and other products? You know, you want there are a number of people they they have meat CSAs available now. People who are growing food locally who you, so you can know know your grower. Overall, that's a tough one. So, well, what kind of meats do you get usually? Me, yeah. I, I don't do a lot. I don't do much. I do. I won't lie. I, I do some, but I don't yeah. buy a lot. Yeah. But if, if I were, example, I, Whole Foods has certain standards that they require of those who provide meat for them. Mm-hmm. I happen to know and, and sat on a board with a man named Will Harris, who has White Oak Pastures. He has the largest on-farm processing facility east of the Mississippi River, mm. right down there in South Georgia. He he was he, he has beef. That, that's grass-fed beef, I mean, genuinely grass-fed. How do I know? Because I've seen it. He's just started growing chickens and turkeys in, in the same same humane method, methods, and he's processing them on site. So, Nadia, the, the key is, is to know who grows your food. There are a couple of grow Farm 255 up in, in the Athens area. They have a, a meat CSA. So even their, their, their shop down here on, on Ponce Farm Burger, they've taken... They get beef from a number of grow Riverview Farms uh, grows beef and pork, chickens. They have all this stuff. So there are growers around that you can find if you go to uh, on the website web uh, internet uh, to localharvest.org. They will give list on there who grows food in your area. So if you really want to get clean food, you should always know who grows it. That's why we're so pleased to have at our market, we have the markets on farm. Okay, most of farmers markets, people are bringing food to a location when they can sell it. With us, you come to the farm to get your food right here in the city. Okay. Yeah, which is uh, great. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's something, 
a few years a few years back that would be considered an oxymoron farm in the city uh, but you're finding uh, more and more of that happening but so people can actually come out and see where the food is being grown how it's being grown the quality of their food and i think this is of fundamental importance and you can do the same thing with with beef miss linda she was talking about that tenant tenant Tennessee tomato, and the man was represented as being local. Well, that's some. In fact, Whole Foods' definition of local is everything from Virginia South. Yeah, and, right. um, <laughs> so when you talk about, you know, and so it's really more. It didn't come in from California anyway. It didn't have those God. petrol I mean, dollars. Which is the point. Yeah. You know, the, the, they, in order to be able to keep their stores full, they have to stretch um, their the territory from which they will draw to bring that food in. But you're right. It's not coming. Most of it is not coming from California, which is the richest agricultural producing region in the history of the world, is the, the Central Valley and the San Joaquin Valley in California. Um, so they're getting the local. So I would not consider a Tennessee tomato local. To me, a Tennessee, a local tomato is the one that's just, you know, Five, six blocks down the street. Uh, <laughs> truly living well. Uh, we have a caller. We have a caller, Rashid. We do. All right. John, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Welcome, okay. John. Can you turn that volume up a little bit, Nadia? Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, John. I'm, um, I'm driving while I'm talking, which I usually never do. But oh. I, have, I have a couple of very pertinent questions. Number one, the recent fiasco with the demonizing of the immigrants. It's caused a terrible, terrible uh, situation, which we'll go into next summer probably in the same condition as the repubs who run every part of, I call them repubs Republicans. They control the state house, the state senate, and every state office. So you have to speak to the people in charge. But briefly, leaving the crops in the field because the guest workers didn't come up from Florida this year because they're scared of these terroristic laws that, and put them in jeopardy of being sent back and their children. Could you speak to that and give me a more viable figure than what the AJC said, $40 million was lost. It must have been double to triple that. And our co-op solution for people, since they've all been changing so much, that for 700, for instance, made $9 million but said they didn't make a dime to give in to the people. Could you attack those two questions? Thank you, John. Go ahead, Rashi. I wanted some clarity. On oh, I'm the sorry, one. Yeah, John. Are you still there? I'm right here. Okay, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Let me. I, I got the first ones. The immigrants. I'm not quite sure what the second question was. Please, sir. You still there, John? We're losing. We're losing him, Rashid. Yeah. All right. Thank um, you so much. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Still listening, John. I'm sorry. I, I I didn't quite grasp the second question. But the farmers down in South Georgia. You know, Georgia is the fourth largest vegetable producing state in the country. Yet Georgia import more vegetables than they export. Uh, even locally, we still have an export economy. Export economies are, are what's destroying uh, a lot of the uh, economic relationships around the world. People growing things, and, uh, producing things to export and have to import. Uh, it's called import-export <laughs> substitution. It makes no sense. So even here, you drive down in the country, you'll find farmers who are growing vast acres of peanuts, cotton, the corn, and soybeans, but you don't see a vegetable garden in the yard. Yeah, they're they're right, buying food right. to come in. If the local IGA or, or Piggly Wiggly closed down, they would starve. And so all those growers down in this state who are growing vegetables really suffered. I, can't, I have no idea about the dollar amount, but they really suffered because they did not have the labor to, 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 uh, to harvest the crops. Now, how it works is this. You have labor contractors who contract with the farmers. Okay, your crops are going to be ready on such and such a date. I'll have X number of people come in here and, 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 and harvest your crop for you. So it's not the individual immigrants who are contracting with the farmer is a labor contractor. Again, you got that choke in the middle who is who controls the supply and the demand of labor for these farms. And the migrant workers will move across the areas to harvest whatever happens to be in season. Now, one of the things that, that, that people are, are, are miss, missing is that if we honestly got rid of all of these so-called illegal immigrants who are in this country... Commerce would shut down. 
Okay, you go to a hotel and see who cleans your room. You look on the garbage truck and see who picks up your garbage. You go down to the farm, which most of us in the city don't get to see who's picking the food that's out there. So I think it's a mistake for us to think that that uh, I mean, who's going to do the work? Most of these folks that that many of the people here who are listening will not go out there and pick those crops off the field. And we got folks who are willing to do that. Uh, and you know, it's so interesting the metaphor. The metaphor of having others outside outsourcing the work, really, I, I saw this when I was in, in, the, in, the, in the government. I was in the first Clinton administration. And Al Gore, who's the vice president, he had held, head, headed up the initiative to reinvent government, to streamline it, make it more efficient. And, and you know what they did? All the jobs that they cut within the government... They went out and hired contractors to do the work. They have contractors to come in to wash the, the, the boards and to pick up the trash. It's even the same thing, and it's insidious. All the money that's gotten spent on these wars, who's it going to? It's going to the multinational corporations who support the war machine. So you don't actually have the government. It used to be that when a soldier got punished, they put him on KP, Kitchen Patrol. But now you got Halliburton who's, who's producing the food and giving you fifty dollar meal, fifty dollar hamburgers and that kind of thing. Yeah, it ends up costing more money yes, to do this, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, we're going to have to take a short break, right. and when we do, I uh, I have the rest of John's question for okay. you. All right. And welcome back to Just Peace. Of course, you are. We are talking tonight with Rashid Nuri from Truly Living Well. And I just want to repeat the end of a question that our last caller had called in with. And he asked about co-ops. Mm. And he wanted to know if you would recommend co-ops as an alternative to uh, your local <coughs> Publix or Kroger. And uh, he mentioned Sevenanda and indicated, I don't remember the figures, but that they had made quite a bit more than they reported. Really? Well, you know, Save Adana is one of the largest food co-ops in the country. Um, and the co-op model, I, I was fortunate many years ago to work with co-ops, uh, farming co-ops throughout the South. But I'm not the one who needs to answer the question about co-ops. That's, that's Heather's thing. She's the, the cooperative expert. But And, and I, will, I will step aside for her after I say this, that, that the co-op methods of, of production, distribution, and exchange are good because it, it, it's, it has... People involve in the decision making about their own future. We uh, let me shut up. You you talk, and then we talk, tell them about about the people down in Brazil what they do. No, you talk. I don't know. You talk well, about the people in Brazil. Well, let me just mention there are cooperatives, of course, um, throughout the South. And, and my work work, I work with the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. And it's interesting, Rashid, that uh, you're talking about people controlling, uh, making management decisions. It's absolutely right because it's owned by the people. There's one person, one vote in the cooperative, and people make decisions uh, based on what everyone wants to do. But you are controlling everything. You're controlling the market. You're controlling the finances. You're controlling ideas with production. So it really is uh, the ideal, I think, um, economic democracy system economic democratic system. It really is. So with the Federation, we have agriculture cooperatives, we have marketing cooperatives, we have um, craft cooperatives, we have housing cooperatives. So you can do almost anything you want with, with, uh, with, with the cooperative model, really. But go ahead. So talk about Brazil. Well, they come, and this is true all over the world. You have all these different kind of co-ops that, that systems that are available. But I was just impressed with with uh, uh, what they're doing in the, the soybean growing region in Brazil, where they have set up whole communities where people educate themselves, grow food together, market together. Uh, as, in contrast to the large farms that are right next door, they have taken charge of their own lives, as you just enumerated yeah right it's it's you know you can you can see people transformed i must i must say that one of the discussions we don't have enough about i think is that you know here we've been well we talk fairly frequently about the 1964 voting rights that civil rights act and the 1965 voting rights act um giving people the right to vote <laughs> but one of the things we don't talk enough about is what happened when people tried to exercise those rights Okay, so the Federation was working with people who dis who were living in rural areas, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, that is. When they started to vote, if they were living as sharecroppers on someone else's land, they were kicked off the land. 
Oh, they and so, I mean, the reason I mentioned the reason I'm mentioning this, Rashid, and I'm sure you want to add to that. The reason I'm mentioning this is that one of the early staff people uh, with the Federation was Wendell Paris, who got involved with the cooperative in Tennessee, because these farmers were relying upon some resource to get uh, fuel for their tractors and so forth. And when they started to vote, they were not able to get the fuel anymore. The the owners of the these companies stopped giving them fuel. So they started a cooperative. And they started, it just transformed them as well. But they started getting fuel from some other place. But they could they could get it, uh, they could get good deals on the fuel because they were um, going in, um, they were pooling their resources and doing it that way. It was just, it's a wonderful model. It's a, it made all the difference in the world for them. Necessity is often the mother of invention. Um, they were forced by the circumstances to, to cooperate with one another where they have been divided in the past. Uh, you've been very involved with the Pigford lawsuit. And a lot of people don't understand that you know, the, they hear about the land loss that's taking place, but don't understand the cooperative effort that, that was engaged in to get these farmers off the land. Stop and think. When Martin Luther King was marching through the South and all he, he and his crew all got arrested, who got them out of jail? The, got them out of jail were the black farmers who put up their land to raise the bail to get those folks out of jail. So what would happen is you have those county committees say, well, we can't have this. Here, you know, there's all these disruptors coming out, what were the other names that they called folks coming in there. So what they, they would do, very insidious things in ingenious ways. For example, if, you know, the farmer has to borrow, you're going to make a crop, you probably have to borrow a half a million, a million dollars every year to, and pay it back. And so you want to go, you go in the wintertime and, and put your application in and you get your money in January, February, so you can start putting your crop out in March and April. So rather than just telling you no, like they may have done with some of the folks, in the example you gave around the few, they said, yes, sir, they would drag it on and end up giving these people their, their money in April and May uh, after they have put up their land to borrow the money, and then they don't have time to make a crop. Then they're able to take that land back and kick the people out. Sharecropping and is, is a is a form of economic slavery that still exists all over the, this country, particularly in the South. Is, uh, isn't that kind of what the uh, the folks who are contracting with Purdue to raise chickens? It's sort of like a sharecropping. In some yeah, contract farming is one step above sharecropping because those folks, the contract farmers generally own their own land. Right? Uh, where the sharecroppers don't own the land, they're, 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 uh, they're farming on Mr. Bobby Joe's land, and, and, and he, they're there. And when you see the same family, I have seen the same family living on the same piece of land for four and five generations with the same, what do you call them, bricks, uh, houses with one light bulb inside there, an outhouse out in the back, uh, and continue, eat, no matter how hard they work to try and get their bills paid, they still owe at the end of the year. They're slaves. By any other name, they're still slaves. Yes. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, Rashid, right? <laughs> and our time is going so quickly. I want to provide the opportunity to shift gears here for a moment. One of the, th one of the discussions I've had with you is that it would be really interesting if in this election next year, we're going into politics for just one moment here, if there were two black candidates running for president. I'd pay to see that. I'd love <laughs> I think everybody should support Herman Cain so you can have Barack Obama and Herman Cain. Run against each other. I get a bowl of popcorn and a cold drink and sit back and watch that. The white folks in this country would go crazy. They would have no idea what to do if you had two black candidates running for president. Now, I'll be very honest. I, I have a problem with both of them personally, but I just think it would be so amusing from a historical point of view to watch that. I'd pay, I'd, I'd pay for that. <laughs> it would be interesting. Well, we'll have, we'll have to see what happens in the next little mm. while. Rashid, I want to thank you again for coming in and talking so much about all of this. You have something else you want to uh, yeah, say? Yeah, call there? me. Yeah, right and your me. number is four zero four five two zero eight three three one. And your website is what? Trulylivingwell dot com. And you can email me at Rashid R A S H I D at trulylivingwell dot com. And you're having your markets coming up um, in, uh, every on... Tuesday. When? Excuse me. We have a market every Wednesday, Wednesday in East Point on Washington Road, 3353 Washington Road, from 2 until dusk. Fridays, same time, 2 until dusk, at 75 Hillard Street in the Old Fourth Ward off of Arbert Avenue near the King Center. You're very welcome. All this information is on our website. Right. And um, so tell us about, we have just a few minutes, couple of minutes here. 
what crops or what can people get? I know you've told us before, but tell us again. I'd love to. Yeah, if it please. Does, if we don't get a snow that freezes up the food, <laughs> we will have, which they're predicting, we'll have, we got lettuce, we have uh, carrots, we have beets, turnips, kale, broccoli, collards, mustards, still less the sweet potatoes. We actually have some tomatoes that have been in store. What else we have? We have some uh, pepper jelly. Um, and I'm sure the cabbage, we got lots of, we have about four or five different kinds of cabbage. Four or five different kinds of cabbage. Yes, this sir. is what's so intriguing about, yeah. about the garden. There's so many different kinds of different kinds of vegetables. Yes, and there fruit. are. Yeah. Yes, there is. Okay. Yeah. So what's going to, what's happening with your chickens, Rashid? You're going to, you're going to be getting chickens, right? Yes. We're going to get some more chickens. I hope, uh, whoever swooped them up the last some, some time will leave them alone this time. Yeah, but you're going to get some chickens. Absolutely. And the people will be able to get eggs as well. Absolutely. Okay. And you also have bees. I know you're not necessarily selling well, our bees, honey. But. No, no. Particularly, we, we robbed them once in the summertime. That honey got gone so quick. Uh, but the bees are there primarily to pollinate, and we certainly don't rob them this time of year. We want them to have real food. Uh, over the winter time, and so we leave them alone until spring. All right, Rashid, thank you so thank much. Thank you for it's having me, Heather. It's always a it's, just, it's always a blast. Yeah, it's just a pleasure.